if there's one thing I know better than everybody, it's uh, how to make films. I've never done one. I don't know how to do it, but I'm a man, and that's pretty much enough. I've seen Fast and Furious 9, the good one. Uh, the last time we recorded with, with these people and the women was uh, to do a worst of the best or a best of the worst. It was quite a while ago. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> Get it? I said it wrong. So what we've got them back here to do today is, we, of course, you've got the lovely Kelly. Hello, Kelly. Hello. How are you? Wonderful. Why? What have you heard? Ah, everything. Well, part of it's not true. Thanks, Lemmy, for keeping your mouth shut. Uh, speaking of Lemmy, we've got uh, Lemmy here. Hello. Mm. I'm doing good also. Okay, let's make it all about you. Just a little <laughs> bit more. And uh, thankfully, someone with a bit of manners, a well-raised person for a chance, but that's not me. Uh, that's what the uh, reviews said. Uh, the lovely Christian Blatt. Christian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Husey. Thank you for uh, scheduling this one you did. You gave the Americans here on the show the proper amount of time. We're mourning an American hero. Of course, I'm speaking of Orenthal James Simpson, mm. the number one American hero for uh, most of our lifetime. So it's a it's a really sad day. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, why would his uh, bitch uh, ex-wife's family try to ruin his legacy like this? Like, didn't they want Naked Gun 4? Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, we never got it. We never got it because of Fred Golden. Thank you. Some people are just selfish, and uh, I hate Nicole Brown. There you go. Yeah, you have that in common with OJ. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. We're starting off on a good one. Uh, so what I've, uh, I've amassed this table for, the, this round table for this episode is we're going to debate Quentin Tarantino. Uh, at the time of recording this, he's about to begin production on his final film, so-called of all time in September or October called The Movie Critic, which uh, I don't even want to go into that shit. Uh, movie critics are full of shit. They tried to say that San Andreas star in The Rock was full of plot holes. You don't know shit. But today we're going to go through Tarantino's back catalog, or should I say hack catalog? <laughs> you like that, Lemmy? No. All right, well, uh, we'll edit that part out. So we're going to go through each one. We're going to get an opinion, and there will be a vote to discover whether or not Quentin Tarantino sucks. Uh, he here's a joke that I've just thought of uh, by myself. Christian didn't say this yesterday with evidence. We should call this episode, Does Quentin Tarantino Suck Hose? I just came up with that. Me. What do you think of that one, Lemmy? I like that one. That one was a good one. Nice. All well, thanks to me. Very, very, very funny, Husey. That's a great joke. Thank you. Totally <laughs> original. It is. And uh, there's no one more original than Quentin Tarantino, the cover band of Hollywood. And we will start with the first one. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. Let's just start off by getting uh, the big mouth herself, uh, Lemmy's uh, opinion on this one. This came out in 92. Uh, what was your take on Reservoir Dogs? I liked it for all the reasons people don't like it. It actually gave me a love for movies that were dialogue forward. You know what I mean? I liked hearing the little blurbs at the diner or the dumb random shit that they talked about in the car. It made me pay attention. It was like short little stories, a break between plot lines, you know, and it made me appreciate movies with random dialogue. Really? I like that kind of thing. Hmm. I think it's ADD, but I, I like that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, Christian, what's your Reservoir Dogs take? Is it a yay or a, or a N word? Nay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's definitely a yay uh, because I uh, I saw it in in the theater. Uh, they re released it so that they could put out a fancy trailer for Pulp Fiction, and uh, a, a lot of people I know saw it on home video and they'd had it had things about it spoiled. I really didn't know what it was. My girlfriend at the time was a, a much better uh, student of film. So she had seen Reservoir Dogs. But yeah, that's the one from the story from the last time I was on, nice. actually. Same girl. Yeah. Uh, same theater, actually. 
Anyway, oh. uh, but uh, she wasn't great moved memories. to that. Uh, yeah, she <laughs> really. <laughs> good times, great movies, I think somebody would say. But uh, so I, I remember seeing it and it's, you know, it is that time where it was novel when characters would sit around talking about pop culture, like the diner scene at the beginning, you know, the way they're talking about like a virgin. And, you know, Kevin Smith definitely beat that to death a few years later. But it is one of the charming things about clerks, you know, it's, it's just people like, oh, yeah, we kind of talk about this stuff in this way. And, you know, it's definitely overwritten in a very Tarantino way. But, you know, you're sitting there in the early 90s and this idea that they're taking the time to break down like a virgin. It's like, oh, okay, I, I'm really getting to know these characters. And I think that uh, the, the story and everything, it's, uh, you know, it was really, it was so violent, you know, for, uh, it wasn't really a mainstream film. So yeah, I was definitely impressed by that. And it made me even more excited for Pulp Fiction, where I also did not get a beach in the theater. Shame. Uh, well, speaking of beaches, of course, uh, Kaylee, what is your opinion on Reservoir Dogs? I I agree with Lemmy. Uh, the, it's the dialogue-heavy Tarantino trope. Um, for me, that does not work quite as well. I think it's really self-indulgent, again, speaking to kind of what Christian was saying. And so I think when I first saw it, I liked it. But I think that a lot of that was because everybody else was like, you should like this movie. Anytime that I have rewatched it, I've been like, all right, I'm bored. Why do I care? I don't care about anything that's happening. Yeah. Well, uh, here's my all important opinion is that I totally agree with uh, Kelly. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like the what's it called? Non sequitur dialogue. Is that a, is that a word? Yeah, uh, that's that's a good way to summarize it. Yeah, yeah it, it's stupid. That's just basically what somebody comes up with a man when they can't think of actual dialogue to advance the story, talking about Madonna, uh, talking about Pam Greer in the car, why don't you do something that would sort of ramp up the tension? All this shit should be cut down and edited. And why is it called Reservoir Dogs? Oh. Well, I'm glad they don't do the thing uh, in the movie where they say the title. It's like, well, yeah, you know us. We're really a bunch of Reservoir dogs. I'd rather not know what it means than have them try to explain it. That was would have been so great. But then, <laughs> if, the if when his ear is lying on the floor and he's bleeding, he's like, <laughs> "Stop being such a reservoir dog." <laughs> hey, Kelly. So, Husey, what I will say, and you just kind of hit on this a little bit, and I'm sure that you're going to like my opinion here too. This movie is written and directed like a woman wrote and directed it. It's too long. <laughs> it's too, it's the exact reason that I don't like female directors, writers, poets. You don't need to tell me everything. I want to be shown things. I want to be able to figure things out. So yes, we didn't get the, we're a bunch of reservoir dogs line, but we got literally everything else. So shut up. Yeah. Really, stop hitting on, stop hitting on Husey in front of us. He already <laughs> likes you. Okay? You don't have to say all that. Oh, I've already gotten the beach. But, I was just going to say, I was waiting for my beach, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but the thing about this one that I don't like is that is that it's it's very much a case of uh, self-indulgent with the director, that big chin Frankenstein-faced post-sucking fucker. Uh, not that I have a problem with him. Wants you to know, hey, 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 the dialogue I write, man. And none of it's fucking unique. Seinfeld did it first. So all he did was do Seinfeld the movie with blood and uh, and bombs, right, Lemmy? Yep. So is is this where I'm a buzzkill if I come in and point out that this movie was before Seinfeld was a TV series and nobody wants me to say that so that we can just move on? <laughs> well, when did that's right? Which yeah, this means... came out. This came out in '92. Yeah, so he would have shot it probably '91 at the latest. So that means that I was joking when I said that. So in the end, <laughs> I'm still right. Right, right. Louis? And, right. Thank you. Acting. Yes. As someone who appreciates Michael Richard's stand-up set, uh, you know a thing or two about jokes. <laughs> that, of course, brings us to the second one, Pulp Fiction. I watched this last night because it's, it's the one of his that I've watched the least, and I had... If, as silly as it sounds, I had forgotten my opinion on it. So I watched it again, and 
it is great, but I do like how I pointed out uh, after Kaylee said it first. If you cut out all the the non storyline stuff, Pulp Fiction's about an hour long, but it's what an hour and twenty minutes. That fucking bit at the end where uh, Samuel L. Jackson just talks and talks and talks while he's holding up that fucking gun to Tim Roth or whatever his name is. That yeah. goes on. That's longer than Fast Six. You know, the really good one set in England. And then the it, 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 then that whole thing about the uh, Bruce Willis's girlfriend in it is one of the dumbest, most annoying female characters in the history of Tarantino films. She's stupid. She talks fucking like a child. Like, I want to have... A, she wants to be fat. What the fuck are you telling them this for? And then... It ends with him asking with her, with Bruce Willis asking her that scene to toss a salad, even though he's fucking covered in sweat from fighting. It, it did that whole. Th- oh my god, uh, that pissed me off. Overall, it is good, but one of the things that I did get pissed off at, I was watching it last night, the sheer amount of music drops in it, where it's kind of like, is this because it suits the scene, or is it because the the director has a record? A uh, participation deal. So when he puts the soundtrack out, he can get a a, a cut for his uh, big chin. Uh, we'll start with the uh, Kaylee on this one. What's your take on the uh, Pulp Fiction? So I also rewatched this one last night, and I I pretty much agree with you here. It's it's an okay movie. Um, it's long. I like it. I do enjoy it. It's it's in my top three of films directed by T- Tarantino. I would say. Um, but I don't like that he is trying so hard to be smug all the time and so hard to be like, I, I feel like he's too try hardy. So like the scene with Mia Wallace getting the needle in the chat and, and her heart and, you know, in the corner of the room, there's the game's operation in life. And everybody always cites this as being, you know, Tarantino is he cares so much about details. He puts them in the foreground. Like, that's the foreground. It's not him caring about details. It's him being like, I'm smarter than you. Look at how amazing I am. I did such a good job making this movie. Mm. Uh, and then- I don't, and, and it's another really good example of the nonlinear plot not really functioning well. Um, I don't like how the nonlinear plot functions in this movie. Yeah, and the, the timelines of the scenes don't match up. Like I, I don't, I think that was done on purpose, obviously. But uh, like, and then even the fact that at the start, the uh, that really sexy girl, uh, Honey Bunny, the the hottest girl I've ever seen, uh, she probably gives a, a beige. She uh, that bit where her dialogue changes from the opening to the ending. It's just a case of, but why? What's the what's the sense of this? Which film did you steal that from? Uh. Christian, uh, what's your take on Pulp Fiction? Well, uh, I think that uh, what you're both saying is true, that the linear story is not that strong. And I think if it was presented chronologically, it would have been less, you know, less of that feel of like, oh, I'm seeing something different. The story in and of itself isn't that different. It's the way that we sort of circled through time a couple of times and went back to like, okay, now we see what this was. And, uh, you know, I found that to be fairly inventive. Uh, I think a lot of the individual scenes work well, you know, and I think Tarantino is very proud of himself when he writes like the Royale with cheese uh, bits that uh, everybody, you know, they loved so much that that conversations on the soundtrack album. And uh, one of the most upsetting things, there were so many upsetting things, usually the first time I ever went to France, but number one was the fact that McDonald's did not have an item on the menu called Royale with cheese had a quarter pounder with cheese and i was like Tarantino fucking lied to me how mm-hmm. dare he but um i think that it's got some you know good performances um most notably the part tarantino wrote for himself where he gets to say his favorite word again and again uh you know <laughs> we have to give it we have to even those of you who don't enjoy the film we have to give him accolades for uh you know the wish fulfillment that uh he creates in there and uh the the music i think does really stand out because i think it's it's some really good song selections it's it is a soundtrack album that i owned mm-hmm. uh but it it gets strong armed in there. And I thought just to go back to Reservoir Dogs for a second, I meant to mention this. I love the idea that he's like, I want to use all these 70s songs. 
So everybody's just going to be listening to the same radio station that is having a 70s super sounds of the 70s weekend. So I like when, you know, he tries to have it make sense instead of in a film that I don't like where everyone's listening to 70s music and it is set in 1995 and there's no reason for everyone to be listening to 70s music. Yeah, but it's funny that that, that part where you mentioned his uh, performance in it, his cameo at the end and the final uh, scene, I from watching that last night, he is a shockingly bad actor. Uh, he has a, a vocal tick where he has to say, all right, or okay, at the end yeah. of every sentence. It's like, you're allowed to edit that out, Big Chin. <laughs> you could you fucking Jay Leno fucking piece of shit, brown-eyed, brown haired, no offense, let me, a scumbag, I hate them all, Christian, no offense. Uh, That's fine. It was just, it was unbelievable that end scene that this is that he would, this assassin guy would walk into his house and that fucking, uh, he would let this guy away with saying the N word in front of him, what, three or four times in a minute. And, and I just thought like that that was, uh, it was weird, but at the same time, it kind of felt, is this the writer trying to be edgy or is it just because uh, of the mania? Uh, let me, your thoughts. I loved Pulp Fiction, but I think it was because, like, I love Pulp Fiction. My mom had the soundtrack growing up. I've listened to it. So I still listen to the entire Pulp Fiction soundtrack. If I listen to one song, I listen to them all. But two things. <clears throat> yeah, Bruce Willis's girlfriend was really fucking stupid in that movie. She's the reason he ends up dying in that movie because nope. she's too fucking stupid to remember. Yeah, because huh? she didn't remember the watch. He had to go back and get his fucking watch. He doesn't die. Yeah, no, but Butch, Butch, and and that dumb French fucking no offense to her, uh, escape on Zed's bike after they survived the. Uh, oh, that's say, right. He killed. He killed Travolta in that movie. That's yeah. right. I had it backwards. After oh, I guess not. Yeah, he avoids banana backwards. forces and steals the bike. Well, he it's almost was killed because of her negligence, and mm. B. The whole, what Kaylee said about him trying too hard to look super smart in the movie, at that point in his career, he was kind of like the new kid. Reservoir Dogs wasn't really super well known. He had written a couple screenplays and stuff, but he was starving. And you can't fault a brand new director for trying too hard to put everything he's got into a movie. And it becomes such a fucking banger like Pulp Fiction. Mm. So that's a four thumbs up? Yes, all four. <laughs> that brings us next to uh, Jackie Brown. Now, well, uh, I think we should uh, avoid censorship and not go with uh, Lemmy first on this one. Uh, Christian, what was your take on 1997's Jackie Brown? Well, I'm glad you asked, Hughesley, because uh, I took the time to rewatch it yesterday afternoon. Uh, here in the U.S., you should be jealous. We have a streaming service called Peacock. And it unironically shows up on your computer. It says it's called Peacock. And I watched it there, despite it being two and a half hours. And the reason why I watched it is because in my memory, it was the one Quentin Tarantino phone, uh, one Quentin Tarantino film that I actively disliked. And I rewatched it and I was remembering, oh, yeah, I didn't like it because it's so goddamn boring. The pacing is slower than anything else I've ever seen him do. The music breaks are just long, uh, as Casey Kasem would say, they're fucking ponderous. It's just sitting in the car and singing along. The film ends that way. And I'm like, so what's the next scene? Oh, you forgot to film it, didn't you, Q? Uh, I think individual performances are good. I think uh, De Niro probably wouldn't remember he's in that movie because I don't know if he wakes up the entire time that he's in it. Um, just really the only shining star in the whole film is Bridget Fonda's tits. Uh, I was uh, just reminded that there was a moment in time where she just had a rocking body. But the um, I think it's the story in and of itself is interesting because fucking Elmore Leonard wrote it. That's why the story is good. But Tarantino does not do a good job of telling that story. And I was very disinterested while watching it yesterday. You know, I think that's quite sexist to say the word tits. Everybody knows they're referred to as uh, milkers. You're right. I'm sorry. That's that's probably a you know a, a, an ethnic or regional difference. 
Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of milkers, we're spoiled with choice here, but uh, we'll go with uh, Lemmy for this one. What's your take on uh, Jackie Brown? I didn't even know Jackie Brown existed until about 2004. I was watching the show called The L Word with Pam Greer in it, and my mom was like, hey, that's that's that chick from Jackie Brown. So I went and looked into Jackie Brown, watched about 20 minutes of it, thought it was boring as shit, and I never tried watching it again. Really? Uh, I do. I, I have to interject because I love the heartwarming story of you and your mom watching the L word together. Uh, <laughs> I, I love the the level of indoctrination that was going on in that household. Yeah, he I, went I to was, Christian school. <laughs> yeah, Lemmy was uh, sending me screenshots of Christmas during the family reading of uh, Mein Kampf, and then they they sat down to eat a, a dead horse while watching a Serbian film. I got uh, to eat a tart this year. I beg your pardon. I said I got to eat its heart this year. Oh, good. I was worried in case you said something vicious. Uh, Kelly, what is your opinion on Jackie Brown? So I, like Christian, watched Jackie Brown last night. However, I, like Lemmy, only watched the first half because I fell asleep. Um, <laughs> it was so, it's so long. It's so boring. The acting, I agree with Christian here. The acting was really good. And the storyline, I think Christian hit on something super important, which is that the storyline is really good. If this movie had been directed by somebody else, I probably would have loved it. If this had really leaned into being black exploitation and had been directed by a good director, I think I would really, really enjoy this movie. So, such as Michael Bay or Brett Ratner. Just think about yeah, of how course, great this of story course. would have been. A yes. couple of the greats yeah. of the, yeah. the late 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the whole any time I rewatch it, I just think, why can't this be on the level of Rush R three? You know, the really good one. Yeah, it's good shit. That well, uh, they do both have Chris Tucker in it. See, well, no, you're thinking of Samuel. Oh, yeah, I thought you were just saying they all look alike. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. They are both in it. Uh, Sam Jackson's character choice, every aspect of the way that he looks, the way that he talks, and I was like. Uh, I bet if uh, Quentin could go in and George Lucas, you know, CGI and replace some of what he looked like, maybe he would do that because <laughs> I was like, oh, this didn't age well between the time they shot it and the time it was released. Just the look that he has with the the little the, the little long skinny Fu Manchu mustache at the bottom. And, uh, you know, he gets to say the N word so much, which is probably why he's one of Quentin's favorite actors. Oh, yeah. Well, I got to be honest. I absolutely love Jackie Brown. It was the I, I thought it was pretty much flawless. Uh, Pam Greer, you still would in it, uh, although you probably would have opened a window. Let's be honest at her age, but uh, nothing I wouldn't do. I can't breathe anyway. I have had decades of nose beer, but yeah, I loved it. I thought the soundtrack was great. I thought I liked Robert Forrester, uh, even though. Funny, this is a hilarious story. I was supposed to interview him, and then he died from brain cancer. <laughs> what a life. It's a funny story. I love it. I love telling that one. I'm going to tell that at one of the Lemmy's Christmases. But, yeah, no, I this would be, out of the three so far, this would be my uh, personal favorite one. But I did hear that uh, Quentin Tarantino and... Uh, Robert De Niro did not get along during production, which I guess which is why you see uh, De Niro pretty much in a huff on camera. And uh, ha ha! Silly old Italians. So that would be three thumbs down for Jackie Brown. Then we get to uh, 2003's Hill Bill Volume 1. Here's a hilarious joke, everybody. You ready? Hey, Kelly, how come you didn't dress up for the discussion? <laughs> you like that, Lenny? I pretty much got hard as soon as I saw Kaylee. So mm. Thank you. <laughs> that makes all of us. There we go. I wish I could remember what that feels like. Uh, Kelly, <laughs> what was your opinion on uh, Hill Bill Volume 1? Uh, despite my shirt, I am not a huge Kill Bill fan. I did not see Kill Bill Volume 1 or Volume 2 until about five years ago for the first time. So I was very late in the game on these movies. Um, and 
again, for me, it's just all of the Tarantino tropes. It's the self-indulgence. It's the dialogue. It's the it's the gratuitous violence that I feel like doesn't add anything to the plot. I love a violent movie. I want violence in the right ways. Um, and I found both volume one and to skip ahead to volume two to just be forgettable for me. Hey, speaking of violence, have you ever seen Brett Ratner's Tower Heist? Uh, no. Oh, so there's a great action scene where Casey Affleck's hanging from this balloon and he's knocking into stuff. You're like, oh my God, his legs. It's so intense. Yeah, uh, I need that. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, let me, what did you think of Kill Bill Volume 1? Every scene is emblazoned in my mind. So when I hear Kaylee say it's a forgettable movie, I have to, I had a completely different experience with Kill Bill. I, I probably have seen that movie over a thousand times. I was obsessed with both the Kill Bills, actually. I loved them. I loved Go-Go. I loved all the gratuitous violence. I love all the blood spatter scenes. I loved every, I can't find a single thing about Kill Bill that I didn't like. I have no complaints. I heard, uh, not to cast aspersions, but I heard that, uh, Blood splatter is what happens every time Stuttering John farts. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, what's your take of Kill Bill Volume 1? Oh, uh, I do remember, uh, again, I believe I've seen all these in the theater, uh, and I just remember being, you know, really just kind of blown away by it. And there's so many visuals that day with you um i would be hard pressed to tell you where the story of one ends and where the story of two picks up uh i would say that it probably would have been a perfect movie if it was just one film that was like you know the way they make movies now two hours and 59 minutes um but i think that you know at least at the time you kind of respect the idea that uh, well he had this vision and he divided it up into two films not at all for box office considerations you know the studio didn't get in his ear and say hey how about we make two of these uh yeah sure i can do that but um i yeah i just think that it is one of the, just visually it, it it has its own style whereas a lot of his other movies kind of look the same at least up until this point so uh, i will also give uh five thumbs up to kill bill volume one and really i'll just vote now for volume two because again i don't remember the difference like what happens in one versus two like where does two start i, I honestly don't know uh, doesn't credits. he consider them to be one movie yeah he was at one point he said he was going to uh, he was going to re sorry at one point he was going to release them movie. as like a super cut yeah oh yeah. so he does okay so that makes sense he i don't know if he ever did release it maybe you know let me did he ever actually do the super cut of just like one big long super long movie i don't or think so it, no, I, I don't, don't think he, that he did. At the time. Yeah. And he should have because Nymphomaniac did that. They did the European version of one big yeah, long movie crazy. and then the US mm -hmm. cut of volume one, volume two. So, like, that would have been the perfect opportunity to do it. And then Nymphomaniac was released over here under the title uh, Beeges. Uh, I absolutely hated Kill Bill volume one. It's cartoonish shit. It's, it's the worst example ever of director indulgence self-indulgence the that whole animated thing has no point to it at all why do we need to have the backstory on one person uh, it's just stupid it, it didn't need to be there the whole thing takes way too long the, as christian said if you took the, the films together and included only the stuff that counts as one I mean, is the main story. It would have been a great long film. Instead, it's two uh, not so great ones. My least favorite Tarantino one is Kill Bill. And even worse, that fucking soundtrack became the every douche fucking shit comedy sketch, every trailer, every fucking hacky lazy joke on TV had that Kill Bill theme song playing. It drove me fucking mental. It was everywhere. Uh, fuck him. Kill Bill stinks. I Listening to Lemmy and Christian talk about this, it is possible that because I waited so long to see it that I was already jaded about Tarantino at the time that I saw it. So I will give it another rewatch based on what you guys said. But 
it's so dramatically over the top that it feels purposeful. The cartoonishness yeah. feels absolutely yeah. purposeful. It's an artistic thing that he did. He wanted animation in it. He was trying a new thing. All the choreographed fight scenes. I'm a big fan of choreographed fight scenes and gratuitous blood and stuff like that. I like anime. You know but what it, I mean? So I loved Kill Bill. You ever see uh, Toy Story 3? Yo, oh, yeah, that movie gutted me from the inside out, yeah. actually. But the, the whole, but it's got all those stupid bits in it. Kill Bill, where like, do you remember she says her name and they bleep her name out? Only for it to yeah. be revealed that her name is Beatrix. It's like, okay. Well, why did you bleep her out? Ah, you know, it's one of those things, man. It's like, well, what was in the fucking suitcase? Oh, I can't tell you. It's a mystery. It's like, it's like, so you're a dickhead. You're a, and a, there you go. I said it. Are you happy, Lemmy? I mean, part of me is yes, part of me is no. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> She's well, happy that... from the waist down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably true. Jesus. Uh, well, that brings me to uh, Kill Bill Volume 2, which I actually haven't seen in a while, but I remember really liking. Uh, but then, of course, it's the usual Tarantino shit where it's all intense and she finally gets the bill... And you're thinking, oh, shit, there's the daughter. We're finally going to get the big blow off. And even though David Carradine was uh, 4,000 years old by the time they made it, they stop everything for a really long conversation about Superman comics. And you just think, why? The fucking story's done. Why is this happening? And then Michael Marsden and his boss giving him shit about his hat. Uh, Lemmy doesn't like that anti-hat commentary. So edit the fucking thing down. Oh, God. Uh, Lemmy, you psycho, you animal. What did you think of Kill Bill Volume 2? I loved Kill Bill Volume 2. I think it's probably because I loved Kill Bill Volume 1 so much. I couldn't even, like, uh, I didn't even love one more than the other. I loved the whole digging herself out of the grave thing, her killing uh, Bill, the whole... That Spoiler one alert. killing Pyme. So I mean, well, shit, man. It's in the title. Sorry. It's okay, Lemmy. It's all yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I loved that whole movie, man. The, the, even the scene where that bitch was making a fucking, they were making slushies in the trailer. You know what I mean? That scene is memorable to me. I loved that. I loved that. Movie. I loved Kill Bill too. Uh, She's sitting in the diner, dirty as fuck, just ask for a glass of water. That's 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 cinema. How, how did you pay for it? A beach? Maybe. Uh, Kelly... glass, of, glass of water is probably on the house. They probably didn't charge her. Uh, goddamn bitch. Uh, Kelly, what was your take of Kill Bill Volume 2? I don't know that I could delineate where one, where Volume 1 and Volume 2 started and stopped because I watched them back to back. So I will say the same thing, which is I don't find it particularly memorable. I found it to have all the issues my memory of it is that i found it to have all the issues that i generally have with tarantino and uh christian you brown eyed devil what do you think yeah i just i remember being relieved that i don't know how long it was between the two of them but to finally be like okay now let's uh, finish off this story that uh, you know could have ended in the first one but they chose not to but i remember being just the, as happy with it you know it was like we got more of the story and yeah i, I could probably probably do a tight three hour cut of it if i really wanted to but uh i just remember you know enjoying the first one there was no drop off uh, in the second one at all it just sort of finally paid off a lot of the setup i do agree the thing about bleeping her name was pretty stupid i actually forgot about that till you mentioned it but uh, uh you know there's uh minor qualms it's neither of these are my favorite tarantino film but uh, i do think that they're both very well done then we had a, a four to five year wait. I think, or maybe I can't do, oh, who gives a fuck, math is for nerds, man. Uh, we then got a, a four to five year wait until we got to uh, Death Proof. I, I got to start off by saying I rewatched this one earlier this year and I, I couldn't believe how shit it was. It it started off like a 
but I thought this is going to be great. It's set. It's like, but really like old fashioned film reels, cigarette burns, all that shit going on. Uh, and then right in the middle of it, it just cuts to a generic film, filmed on like a HD camera or whatever. It made no sense. There was endless uh, shots of feet. There was like deliberate mistakes put in the thing where the, the boom mic would get hit and all that stuff, like weird jump cuts. The, then there was that pointlessly really long tracking shot in a diner where those four fat bitches just continuously ate and moved for fucking four minutes like this. And then I thought, why is this happening? Why is this in it? The only thing about it that was great is that Kurt Russell had fucking amazing hair. Uh, he's, he looks great. He was dressed like Snake Plissken. He's fucking back. They should have done a third one. I'm not going to go off on a rant about that. Uh, I did not like Death Proof. I liked the soundtrack. I thought it was better than... Kill Bill Volume 1, but this was uh, not one I liked. Uh, Kelly, what did you think of Death Proof? Death Proof is a movie that reminds me of how much better a director Robert Rodriguez is than Quentin Tarantino. That is that is like the movie that I'm like, oh, right, Tarantino kind of sucks. And Tarantino, I like a lot of things that he's done for the film industry, but death proof is another one where I'm just like, I don't care about anything that you're doing. I think you hit the nail on the head, how you described it. See that, Lemmy? I'm not stupid. You're wrong. Uh, Christian, what was your opinion on death proof? I think it's very funny that uh, Kayla, you said that because uh, as I was putting my thoughts together for this, my note to myself was uh, this is not as good as Machete. Machete is the similar idea of like way over the top, crazy action movie. And yes, Robert Rodriguez tells it better. I think if this had somehow been Tarantino's first film where he was just throwing all these things in and doing the homage to late night movies on television, I think we could all be like, oh, look, he has so much more room to grow beyond this the fact that it comes when it does in his career you're like oh okay it's interesting it's almost like uh it's almost like when a musician you like does a, a you know a solo album and you're like oh, okay that's what it would sound like if they played with the you know other people but let's let's go back to the the real bands let's let's hear what kiss sounds like when they play disco no more solo albums you know uh this is basically what i'm saying this is quentin tarantino's peter chris solo album uh, mm, I, nice I'm, 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 <laughs> thank you uh, let me what's your uh, bad tempered take on uh, Death Proof? I didn't like Death Proof either. I, w I really wanted to like Death Proof, but it just came more, it came off like uh, Stephen King wrote a really shitty like script while he was really drunk and somebody turned it into a shitty short movie. That's mm. how it came off to me. It is the Chris Gaines of Tarantino movies. Well, yeah, I think it, this is one of the very rare ones where you, it's more rare to find people that like it than do. It, it, it just seems to have a generally negative uh, reception. Showing that he does not hang around uh, as much as he likes to pretend, he followed Death Proof up uh, less than two years later with... <laughs> Glorious bastards, pardon my language. I feel sick for swearing like this. Uh, this one, well, you know, we'll start with Lemmy's take on this one because I'm a man and I get to choose whatever, wherever I want to be. Uh, Lemmy, what was your take on Inglorious Bastards? Inglorious Bastards made me a fan of Brad Pitt. I wasn't really a big fan of Brad Pitt until Inglorious Bastards. I loved that movie. I watched that movie like three times in a row when it first came out, like when it was watchable on my own television. Mm. It was intense. I, I fell in love with Christoph Waltz in that movie. I couldn't get enough of him. He played such, I gravitate towards the bad guys and he played such a genius bad guy in that movie. I don't know if you should say that you gravitate towards the bad guys in this one. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. In my <laughs> opinion, I'm not trying to get off political here. Uh, that Hitler guy, see the more I hear about him, real piece of work. And I know you flick your bean to him, Lemmy, but I'm sorry, 
some he, he's he's not just a really cool haircut. He's got bad side to him. Apart from you know, and by that I mean he's a vegetarian. Uh, Christian, what was your uh, uh, opinion of Inglorious Bastards? See, I thought you were going to be upset how they treated the Fuhrer in this film. Uh, I, I expected that to be your number one note that, uh, you know, that they they really did a bit of a whitewashing to uh, to Adolf's uh, legacy. Um, I, I agree with uh, what Lemmy said, is that I was fine with Brad Pitt when he would be in a movie before this, but the sort of the very tongue in cheek of uh, killing Nazis, uh, which I know people hate that that whole performance and everything about it. But uh, I I just found it to be the most probably the most fun sitting there watching because it's like oh, okay, so we're not telling a historical narrative at all. We're just going to you know we're just going to have fun with the multiverse. One of uh, Husey's favorite things is dealing with the multiverse. So in the mm -hmm. multiverse where this happens, sort of the fan service. So uh, you know, I just thought that uh, there were tremendous performances, and I don't believe I'd ever seen Christoph Waltz before this. Uh, perhaps I had, but this is where you really take notice of how great he is, and uh, I, I would say that this is this is definitely not my favorite, but it's probably the most fun to sit in for a rewatch of uh, really any of them. Uh Kelly, your your take on Inglorious Bastard spelt with the E R D S. Yeah, I love I love this movie. I, I completely agree um with Lemmy and Christian here. I will say that I do think that the final scene, without giving away any spoilers, is very indicative of how Tarantino is as a director, because I think it's the final line in this one where one of the characters, I can't even remember who it is, because it's been a while since I saw this, but says, I think this might be my best work yet. And oh, I feel yeah. like Tarantino is just constantly, every single movie that he makes, he has this like little wink and a nod, like I'm the best director that has ever existed in the whole wide world. And with Inglorious Bastards, I think he succeeded. But I hate that attitude so much. Yeah. Hey, look, Kaylee. So, you know, it's not just a great movie. It's probably like my best movie. So if all my <laughs> movies you were going to take and put one on the fridge with a magnet, it's probably this one, you know? Yeah. yeah, this movie's so good, right? If you get the DVD, you can eat the fucking thing, okay? It's like it's like sandwiches, but better, okay? Eat my movie. <laughs> uh, I really liked Inglorious Bastards. I again, there's there's parts of it that I I don't like. I don't like Michael Myers' performance in it. Uh, he's very Saturday Night Liveish. Uh, I also. Uh, I don't like the fucking. I see Tarantino does this to fuck with me because I always watch films on cheat days. Or sorry, when I'm not on cheat days, so that I avoid eating junk food. But when you watch his stuff, there's that close up of that fucking cake they're eating in the in the restaurant, and then it's just like, "Hey, Chin, what's going on here? Whatever, do to you." There's a reason for that. Okay, you interrupt me, woman. I'm sorry. There's a reason for that. She, he was with that pastry and the cream testing to see if she would eat it because back then they made that cream with pork fat. So he was watching her to, and she knew that. So if she ate pork fat, she that's why she grimaced when she ate it because she knew she was eating pork fat. She had to prove to him that she wasn't Jewish, which she was. What? How did you know that? Yeah. How the fuck did you know that? That's in the film? That's not that scene is in the film. I've read some like articles and watched different things from the movie. I loved that movie. I wanted to ingest everything about that movie. But that scene in particular, why it was so in, important is was it was a an homage. It was a little secret little Quentin Tarantino wink and a nod. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm smarter than you type scene. You know what I mean? Those I, I appreciate he, those. It turns I, out I think he's he was, smarter than Husey. <laughs> I think Husey's just trying to figure out, like, there's a much easier way to see if she'll fill her mouth with pork fat. Let's step into the <laughs> toilet and uh, I will have yeah. you prove that you'll take in pork fat. Well, it was revealed she was dead in the black guy. But uh, I, I will say that one of the things I loved about this film is that I remember seeing it in the cinema for the first time. And the music drop of Cat People Putting Out Fire by David Bowie. And I just remember loudly going, 
Yes! Because that's one of my all-time personal faves by Davy Bo. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. I didn't like fucking, um, what's his name? Eli Roth as this somehow supposedly a muscular fucking killing machine. Uh, okay, tough guy. I'll see you in the ring. Uh, I didn't like him being in it. Overall, yeah, I, I like Inglorious Bastards, and I thought we were back on track from the letdowns of a, a previous decade of Kill Bill and Death Proof. Were it to last was something we will find out next. Up next is the uh, the so-called eighth Tarantino film that also happens to be called, wait for it, The Hateful Eight. <laughs> you get it? So you're going to skip Django Unchained? Mm-hmm. Uh, Django Unchained is what I meant to say, because, uh, yeah, well, are you trying to say that I would ignore those people? Well, I I think that's exactly we we all know you well enough to know that that's what you were trying to do. You know, you you feel like it's not Jamie Foxx's finest work. Uh, well, that was his his sitcom from the nineties. We know. See, for me, I don't see color so much that I forgot Django and Chain existed. Uh, well, I don't know if we, if we can handle Adam and Lemmy's thoughts on that one just yet. Uh, we'll start with Kelly. Uh, Kelly, what was your opinion on Django Unchained? So I only saw this one once in the theater, and I remember enjoying it, but nice. I don't remember very much else. What was your favorite line of dialogue from it? Go ahead uh, and say it. I don't know that I can repeat any of the lines what, of dialogue from this movie. What, what, what's your favorite line of dialogue that uh, you hear uh, our buddy Carl say all the time? Uh, there's <laughs> so many lines from this movie that I, I he's just quoting them all the time to producer Chris, you know. Mm. Always. Uh, Lemmy, what did you think of Django Unchained? I thought it was awesome. I thought it was incredibly dramatic. I thought it was a very appropriate timepiece, actually. I hated Leonardo DiCaprio until I saw that movie. Again, I I like a good bad guy, and he played a fucking great bad guy. All the phrenology and shit, like the skulls, and I loved Samuel L. Jackson being the the assistant head house guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was incredible. It the whole the love story between Django and his and his wife was absolutely beautiful. And when they reunited, I I've seen that movie. If I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times, and I cry every single time. She turns around. And he's like, "Hey, little troublemaker." I'm fucking waterworks at that point. Again, Christoph Waltz, incredible, incredible performance. I love mm. that whole movie. He is he's the same way. He cries every time he sees Tokyo Drift. Yeah. It's it's just when Dominic Toretto turns up at the end. That's when you realize, oh shit, it's on. And thankfully for Paul Walker, it was back on, unlike his face in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, Christian, what is your take on Django Unchained? <laughs> I agree with what Lemmy is saying that uh, you know, before this and a little bit since then. There was definitely a little bit of DiCaprio fatigue, but it's such a great role for him because it's like, no, 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 we're supposed to hate you. And he gets it and he just really turns into it. But uh, also what Lemmy said, uh, this is possibly my favorite performance from Sam Jackson as uh, the term that uh, Lemmy used as the house guy, uh, as I believe what they would call them in those times. He's like, yeah, you're the house guy the other guys out in the field uh, that he was, but just uh, the, the, you know, the yes man that we hate in so many stories, uh, you know, in, in our lives, he's, you know, he's like the, the, the squid head guy in Jabba the Hutt's palace, you know, it was just like, yeah, whatever you say, you know? And uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, I, there's a count of how many times the N words used in this movie. And I can't remember what it is, but I remember that when it was out, they told you how many it was. And, uh, it's probably why it's Quentin's favorite film that he made because of just how many times it, uh, he got to write it on his little typewriter. But uh, yeah, there's there's no real complaints uh, about this. Uh, it uh, to me it fits the narrative that he was getting better as a filmmaker. There we've got a couple of detours like Death Proof and you know Jackie Brown for me, but uh, 
I, I think that this was the one where it ended. I'm like, oh, he made like a, a like a movie. He didn't make just a Tarantino movie. He was able to go and make an actual film. Well, uh, for me, I have to give this uh, an, a very average review. It was another one of these ones, a lot like uh, a lot of Tarantino stuff, where it just seems to go on and on and on, where uh, it's like, we get it. Like that whole bit when Tarantino turns up in it and he's playing a, an Australian and he's so fat that they should have retitled the film uh, Trousers Unbuttoned. Get it, Lemmy? You're muted. I get it. There we go. Very funny. Lemmy farted. Uh, they, they have the thing about uh, the Django as well. Is that, that bit when there's, there's like the big shootout, uh, Django's trying to escape, they catch him. And then he has to escape again, and you just think, but it's it's already ended. You like you didn't have to keep it going. And uh, overall, I liked it. Actually, no, I didn't. I I think that despite the stuff that I say during sex and in traffic, you can hear that word enough to a point where you think I I'm not watching the BYB podcast. I I'm, I'm trying to watch a film. And at some point, even I, someone from Ireland, thinks that's enough of that word. Like, we get that it's about, uh, what do they call them, housemen or whatever? People, house uh, guys. Yeah, house yeah. guys at a house, house guy yeah. buy an auction and stuff. But uh, I don't know. For me, uh, Django Unchained, despite the great song used during the theme, uh, it would be a thumbs down. We once again get to uh, the next one. Uh, the Hateful It. Uh, we're going to start with the, the toughest person in the chat here, uh, Lemmy. What was your opinion on The Hateful It? I've never seen Hateful Eight. Kelly, uh, what was your uh, opinion on the, the Hateful Eight? I love Hateful Eight. It is chilly and it is um the tension is amazing i think that even though it's dialogue heavy i don't get bored during the annoying dialogue heavy scenes during this one um i i just think that this is a really really wonderful like i could i could watch this is the tarantino film that i could watch again and again and again hmm hey christian i know you were going to say that elizabeth shoe plays lemmy in Hateful Eight, but what's your opinion on uh, Hateful Eight? Well, in addition to that, uh, I also felt like to some extent Kurt Russell plays Lemmy in this film. Uh, it's my <laughs> favorite. It's my favorite Tarantino movie, hands down. Like none of like none of them are close. And I believe he originally started writing it as a play, which explains the really confined, very talky nature of it. But I, I don't think that that works against it because uh, it was one of those times where I let myself get tricked into, well, you have to go see it in 70 millimeter. And I did go see it in 70 millimeter and the huge projection of especially all the stuff outside uh, really made it, you know, worth spending twenty five dollars on or whatever it was. But uh, uh, I thought that uh, it's his his most like grown up and maybe least Tarantino movie. You know, obviously there's little things along the way, but I think it's the one that holds up the best. And uh, Lemmy, I hope you take it to heart and uh, go and and see this at some point soon because if you know you're enjoying all these other films, this is just him sort of at his his full powers. You know, this is like Superman flying right in front of the sun, and uh, he's never better than he is when he makes this. I don't know why I've never seen it. I think it's been so many people have told me that I would love that movie. And maybe I've just not watched it out of spite. I'll watch it after the stream. I'll watch yeah. it. I'll watch it after this podcast. Is there any truth to the rumor that you can only count up to seven and that's why you didn't see it? <laughs> um, not at liberty to talk about such things. Yeah, that's mm. fair. That's fair. <laughs> Good response. And, can NBAs and whatnot. Yeah. Can I add on to what Christian said about the 70 millimeter? Um, I also saw this on 70 millimeter and I think it was completely worthwhile. And despite the fact that I am not a huge fan of Tarantino overall of his volume of work, I do think he's done a lot for the film industry in bringing back the idea of going to see film in cinema. And I really respect the shit out of him for that. So I, I respect the shit out of him for the work he did in this film for making a bowl of stew. 
look good because I'm from Ireland. We we invented that fucking shit. Uh, I have to be uh, more like the the plateful it. Get it? <laughs> what do you think about that, Lemmy? I love it, dude. I love a bad pun. Uh, that was a good pun. Don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I thought that Hateful Eight was uh, way, way too long. Again, going back to my wokeness, uh, I thought that uh, it got to the point where it's like, okay, we under- we get it now. They're, they're racist characters. Like, like th- There's a one point Kurt Russell said three racist words in one sentence, and I thought that was kind of shocking. That It was like seeing Avatar again for the first time, where you're like, whoa, that was... That was the most racist fucking thing I've ever seen. I've never seen racism like this before. And then I discovered uh, WATP. But the thing, <laughs> the thing about wait, wait, uh, wait. after after uh, Kurt Russell uses those three racial epithets in one sentence, and did you were you watching it at home because you had to pause it and go through a whole box of tissues and then go back to the film? I'm sure that uh, that was the reaction you had. No, I just whack it off in public now. I can do what I want. <laughs> That's, it is Ireland, yeah, sure. Yeah, we we have rules. If you don't buy uh, food at the concession stand, you're allowed to whack one off. Right, Lemmy? Right. I think I might have been actually mistaken. I think I've seen some of Hateful Eight. Is he, like, handcuffed to a lady in that movie? Yeah. They're right. in, like, a stagecoach. Yeah, that's the beginning part. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've seen I've seen the middle portion of this movie. I've not seen the beginning. I've seen the middle and I've not seen the end. And I remember I I, I do remember. It. They're in like a tavern. What? Yeah. Or some that's, shit. It sounds like Lemmy went to see this at a drive-in theater and the car was full of people. It's what it sounds like the way you're mm-hmm. talking about this. <laughs> so you sort of you came to for a little bit in the middle and and that's all you remember. I think somebody else in the house was uh, watching it. He started watching it. I came in like probably 30 minutes into it and I fucked off probably 30 minutes before it ended. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he- Haley, I have to apologize for speaking over you. Unlike what Husey would do. I feel bad when I speak over a woman. Uh, what were you trying to say where I strong on my way in front of you? Oh, I have no idea. My thoughts were okay. meaningless because I'm a woman. So yeah. Uh- God damn it, Husey's always right. Husey, you win again. I shouldn't have gone back to her. We now come to the final one for now. Once upon a time in Hollywood. <laughs> His most recent one, uh, and one that I only discovered last night that I don't own on uh, Blu-ray, so I will order one from the Blu-ray shop, as uh, I think they're called. Uh, Kelly, what is your opinion on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? So I just watched this about a month ago. And I think it is Tarantino's love letter to himself because nobody loves Tarantino as much as Tarantino <laughs> loves Tarantino. Um, I think it's smug and snarky and self-indulgent. And I did not like it. I thought it was too long. It, it, this is the epitome of Tarantino being Tarantino to me. Oh, wow. I know. Hey, I know. Unpopular opinion, probably. Hey, Christian, what is your opinion on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I think uh, everything Kaylee says uh, about the film is accurate, but it's probably exactly why I like it. Uh, you know, yes, it's a love letter to himself, and he's very proud of himself for his nods to old Hollywood and and things like that. Uh, you know, the the scene with uh, with Bruce Lee, and just there's so much stuff that's just it's crazy, you know, and the the Manson family, and even having seen Inglorious Bastards, I'm sitting there just thinking the whole time. I'm like. Oh, so are we gonna get like the 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 massacre of Sharon Tate and everyone in that house? Has he like just been waiting his whole career to film that? And then you're reminded, like, oh yeah, yeah, right. This is it's not what's gonna happen. It's once upon a time in Hollywood. 
So we sort of get the happy ending of flame throwing, uh, flame throwing uh, a bunch of uh, the Manson family, and uh, it, it it again. This, there's a lot of fun to this one. No, it's not his best movie, but uh, I definitely enjoyed it, and I enjoyed a lot of the nods to the era that it's uh, set in. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't be doing this film justice if we didn't highlight the true star of this film, much like the star of jackie brown i did reference bridget fonda's tits but i also should have talked about her feet that we see so much in that scene in jackie brown we of course once again get margot robbie's uh wonderful toes uh in this film and that is the true star of a movie that i enjoy very much you know i gotta be honest uh margot robbie wouldn't be on my uh list that doesn't do it for me neither margot is- kidder mark margot kidder would present day Oh, God, yeah. She looked like a real whore. Uh, Lemmy, what is your take on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? That's another one that I know for a fact I have not watched this movie. I've never seen this movie. Holy shit. Get that. Uh, well, well, I gotta be honest. Uh, I fucking loved this one. I, I thought the... Uh, the way it was filmed the, the, was was brilliant. I loved the fact that it seemed real. It, it didn't seem like they were just on a bunch of sets, which I think, like like that bit when uh, there's a scene in it where, oh, what's it? Brad Pitt is just has just been at DiCaprio's house and he's driving through Hollywood back to his uh, what do you call them outdoor cinema things? The drive-in theater. Yeah, where he lives in a trailer near a drive-in theater. And it's just this big long here or not this big long scene of him just driving and how they've redesigned the streets for real, you know, like set designed them so that they all look like they're back in the fifties or sixties, whatever the fuck this is set. Uh, I love that. The the Bruce Lee scene is fucking hilarious. Uh DiCaprio's meltdown in the trailer I thought is brilliant because he just he continuously cries. And it's all set in one day, and he's hung over, and he breaks down in tears. What? What? Eight separate times. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned the soundtrack. Charles Manson's in it. Everybody loves Charlie. Good egg. Misunderstood. And he, uh, Danielle Harris is in it. And to prove that I'm not a pedophile, she's a grown woman, uh, and you can't even recognize her because she was like pregnant with twins or something. She's a big fat bitch. Uh, the Elvis Presley guys in it, Austin Butler, Brad Pitt kicks his head in. Uh, uh, oh, and that fucking <laughs> Lena Dunham's in it. I hate her so much, you fucking bitch. But That's how I like good I film. think the movie is. I, I hate her too, and it didn't make me not like the film. And that takes a lot for her to show up on screen and, and me to continue watching whatever the project is. Yeah, and then there's all this talk about, but it, it is a, a another example of his self indulgence of like apparently he filmed something like seven hours worth of usable footage of like episodes of the TV show that yeah. the guy was in. Where it's like, what the fuck are you doing? At what point does this does this cut down? Uh, but yeah, I liked it. So I do like that it showcases his movie theater. So I think that they film at the New Beverly, which is the movie theater yeah. that he bought in LA. And and I will say again, my positive thing about Tarantino always is he has made people care about film again. He has made people want to go back to the theaters. The New Beverly is an absolutely amazing theater. I saw um, The Great Escape there and Nick Frost was sitting next to me and I thought it was really exciting. And, you know, like I it was it's just I, like I like what he is doing for movies, despite the fact that I don't always like his movies. The yeah, Nick I think Frost? it's important. Yeah. The Nick Frost. Hey, that was hey, ready for a good laugh. That was cool. <laughs> you get it, let me. Uh, I, I think it, it can't be uh, understated. Just, uh, w- you know, the institution that the new Beverly is for those of us that live in L.A. And it was closed and he did, you know, he's obviously got money laying around, but he bought it and they they show everything on 35 millimeter. Uh, they, you know, they don't have any digital collection. Yeah. 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 Like they'll, like Friday night, it'll be like, I think it's there's like once a month they show his 
personal 35 millimeter once upon a time in hollywood they don't only show his movies they show great films like teenage mutant ninja turtles and silent night deadly night you know some of the true classics but uh yeah it's a it's a great theater and it, it would not still be open if not for quentin tarantino uh, any news on when he's going to show rush r2 you know if we were to go through the records there was probably a rush hour uh triple feature where they showed yeah. one two and three yeah and then you could come back the next day and see Shanghai Nights. Nice. That's, that's that sounds like my type of weekend. Worth it all, if you ask me. So we now come to the results of the thing. Uh, Lemmy, you're good at math, so can you total up these answers for me? So basically, anything that could uh, that didn't get an overwhelming yes counts as it sucks. So uh, oh. you okay? So Lemmy? you need. You need- I need yeah. four yeses for it to be a, a great film, is what you're saying, Husey. Yes, I think that's oh. right. Well, basically, if, if it doesn't agree with my personal opinion, <laughs> I have to change the rules so that I'm right, so that I don't okay. get sad during the editing process. <laughs> uh, when it came to Reservoir Dogs, we get two yeses and two noes, so that counts as it sucks. Kill Bill got a majority like, so that's a good, so... See, it's already very exciting. I'm I'm, I'm nail biting here. Are you ready, Lemmy? Are you pumped? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, calm down, please. Uh, I thought I said no drinking beforehand. When it comes to uh, racism, it was very high with this one. Uh, Jackie Brown got a sucks. Kill Bill Volume 1 seemed to get a sucks, mostly. While Kill Bill 2 got a good. I've already fucking forgot the fucking thing. I've, I don't know what's going on here. Death Proof sucks. Uh, and Glorious Bastard, good. We get Django Unchained sucks. You there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Uh, we get a good Hateful Eight. And then there was a good uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So uh, does Quentin Tarantino suck, Lemmy? It looks like it's a dead tie. Oh, for fuck. <laughs> Wait, did did you say Wait, Pulp did Fiction, Cusey? Wait, did you count Pulp Fiction? Because I, I wasn't sure I heard you say it when you were going through all of them. Or did, or did we not miss it? And I'm just not paying attention. I like the idea of Kaylee being a tiebreaker. So I No, okay. I have a... Okay, we didn't talk about my favorite Tarantino-directed film. His oh segment my. in Four Rooms. Oh, thank you. That was mine. <laughs> okay, so his segment in Four Rooms is perfectly lovely because it's only 20 minutes and it's just Tarantino light and I fucking love it. Is it the best segment in Four Rooms? No, because again, Robert Rodriguez is a better director than him. So the misbehaviors is way better than, what is it called? I can't even remember. The Man from Hollywood. But The Man from Hollywood is a great fucking movie that is directed by Tarantino. So Quentin Tarantino officially doesn't suck. That's what Thanks Kaylee said. Thank- Thanks to those 20 <laughs> minutes. Now, do I'll we never cha- say do we it cha- again. Do we change the vote if we factor in the episode of ER that he directed in like 1995? He also directed and wrote uh, the season finale, season five of CSI, Gravedigger, which was fucking awesome. The uh, the original Las Vegas CSI, he, he mm-hmm. did that. I, I remember seeing that. Yeah, but I forgot that he had done that. Yes, that's true. So I, I think we've te- when we're factoring in television work, <laughs> we're like, yes, he is great, as a matter of fact. So uh, we would agree that he doesn't suck? I, I think we have to just agree, Cusy. Just toes. Yeah, just toes. Just toes. <laughs> See, that was one of the jokes that I said at the start of the episode. Thank you. I had a, a great time recording with uh, you great well, people and the women as well. Uh, this one will actually... Husey, Husey am, am I able to uh, uh, share that picture that I sent to you? Because I wanted to talk about it while we talk about his great work. I have it on my screen, but I'm not able to share screen. Uh, but I had also sent it to you, so I don't know what... Uh... I, I, I realized you were trying to wrap up the show like a professional host, but uh, I wanted to derail it with a personal anecdote. I think it should be able to share an eye if you, if you can. Yes, it, it is indeed. So uh, I wanted everybody to see uh, <laughs> this is myself and the great Quentin Tarantino at a Comedy Central Emmys after party in 2008. And uh, he was uh, off in the corner. I don't know what he was at the Comedy Central Emmys party for. 
but it was very clear that uh, he was very focused. I believe he was unmarried at this point, but uh, he was sitting with a, with an African American lady, and he was very focused on her for hours. You know, and my friend and I just kept sort of like, "Oh yeah, there he is." And the second she got up to go to the bathroom, uh, we went over and we ambushed him for uh, this selfie. And uh, there are a couple of uh, takes of this photo. He's much less happy in the uh, lead up to this one where I got him to at least grimace. He did not want to be bothered, but his chick was in the bathroom. I feel like the reason I tell this story is because it shows how respectful I am when a man is trying to get his dick wet. <laughs> not bad. He looks so smarmy. He oh. does or I do or both. He does. Yeah, I'm I'm legitimately excited to be meeting him yeah. there. Obviously, yeah. obviously, you can tell this is a while ago because you see his hairline in it. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's that's miraculously a grown back and not a, not a gray hair on his head. It's so uh, crazy, isn't it, Izzy? Uh, let me. What links do you have? What plugs do you have to be linked? Um, Twitch.tv slash Little Lemmy and BYB underscore Podcast uh, on YouTube. And your uh, social media? Uh, zero little Emmy zero on Twitter. And Instagram, which will be linked below, and she posts photos of her milkers, boys. Uh, speaking of boys, uh, Christian, what plugs do you have? Well, I uh, hope that everybody would uh, join Eric Zane and myself every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Who Are These Broadcasters on the Who Are These Podcasts? youtube channel and as carl keeps reminding me it also has its own audio feed if you want to subscribe to the audio version but it is a show where we play videos the video version is the most fun and i have my own personal podcast called the Blackcast, b-l-a-d-t-c-a-s-t both uh kaylee and husey have been on before and uh which means it's about time that i hit up little lemmy uh to uh come on to my podcast uh the black cast b-l-a-d-t-c-a-s-t and uh, you two, uh, Christian and uh, Keely, just recorded a, a train spotting uh, episode. Where can we find that one? We sure did. You're going to be able to find that in probably about two weeks on my YouTube, which is Once Over with Kaylee, C A Y L E Y. Um, it'll probably come out a little bit early as well on my Patreon, which is relatively new. I am doing reviews of popsicles on Patreon. So if you would like me to, if you would like to see me very unsexily review a popsicle, you can come and subscribe to my Patreon. I will probably also be doing some sex toy reviews coming up soon because I have been getting sex toys sent to me for my appearances on Who Are These Podcasts, where you can check me out on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I will also be in Vegas for Hackamania. So come and hang out with me there. Excellent stuff. And, I, and I'll be there too. Uh, don't forget to go to hackamania.com, promo code WATP. And uh, Kaylee, I love how you always pretend that the sex toys arrive in the mail and that it's not just Trucker Andy sliding a box in front of where you <laughs> sit. So, like, hey, open these. Let's see what it is. Sometimes it's producer Chris. <laughs> oh, the rumors are true. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on. I'm going to go order Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on Blu-ray because I've got a home cinema. It's all right. I don't want to talk about it. And we will all look forward to finding out uh, who's been cast in Tarantino's next and final film coming up soon called uh, The Movie Critic. Uh, rumors are that uh, Bruce Willis will be in it, which which would be weird to see. Uh Tom Cruise has been linked with it, but then he's been linked with everything uh, ever uh, except for having sex with women. But uh, I'm either way, this is all good. I'd also like to do this again sometime with people like uh, over names like David Fincher, uh, James Cameron, and of course, Justin Lin. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on. Uh, Lemmy is, owes me a couple of days worth of feed pics, so I'm looking forward to those. Uh, Kelly owes me some arch photos, and me and Christian don't acknowledge the stuff that we uh, send each other, but we definitely do. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Everybody check the links down below, and uh, boycott Kevin Brennan. <laughs>